I'm showing climate to, to customers, to retail, to farmers, whatever the case is, um, they start mapping out a few fields and they say, oh, field-specific weather. And um, the question is always then, what's the geography that you cover? Where, where is it at? And um, so I, I talk about our geography we're in. Climate basic, which is the weather, is, is pretty much nationwide. And so it never fails. Uh, they say, okay, um, they map their fields and they say, well, can we go further north in, in Minnesota? Sure, yeah, you can do that. And they say, well, well uh, how small of an area can you do it? You, know, you, you can map out as small as you want. Okay, so it never fails. All of a sudden the cabin gets put in because they want to know what the weather is like at the cabin. They get that, they're excited about it. They say, hey, now I can, now I can check this out, know if I want to go up there or not. Uh, then they say, well, how small can you get? I say, again, you, you, as small as you want. Okay. And I see a mapping, and they're mapping an area that's, you know, I, I can see an aerial image, and it's, it's not a field. What's that? Well, that's where the deer stand is, because they want to know what's the weather is at the lake, and then the deer stand, and then they'll go worry about the field. So it, it never fails. So get this up. All right. All right, so again, thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. Very excited. What I've seen so far has been fantastic. And um, you're, after seeing this, you're going to think that Jason and I were put presentations together. We, we, we didn't, but they flowed together very, very nicely. So again, my name is Rick Molinar. I'm the climate business manager. I cover Western Minnesota and North Dakota now. All right, so there is some nerves right now with presenting because uh, I ran this presentation that I'm going to show you uh, past a couple of my closest associates, and the reality is is that it did not go over very well at all. Um, I think I get some visuals there. Uh, so that was two attempts at this presentation. Um, that was about five minutes into it. It turns out they weren't that excited about nitrogen management. Um, that continued on even in the spring when I tried this. Uh, there was there was very very little success. These are my two uh, two thirds of my boys, uh, Johnny and Charlie. But um, I, I was pretty excited, uh, you know, thinking about this this presentation when I got to spend a little bit of time behind the wheel combining. But uh, but but they didn't. But I, I hope it resonates a little bit better. And you guys aren't falling asleep, especially not in my lap. That'd be awkward. So. All right, so the Climate Corporation, um, and data science gets thrown around a lot, but, but ultimately, you know, what, what does that mean, right? Um, Dean, I know you like trivia, right? So uh, let's say 10, 15 years ago, what percentage of, of combines had a yield monitor in them? A few, yeah, I don't have the answer, so. Uh, so <laughs> not, not very many, right? And. Uh, <laughs> It's a loaded one, right? <laughs> really depending on you. Um, but, but not many. And, and think where we're at now, where um, the vast majority of the combines now are running a yield monitor, and, the, and they're collecting data, right? Yield data. And it's not just yield data anymore. Uh, we have planters that are going to tell us down pressure, plant spacing, good ride, singulation. We have soils data, right? Uh, fertility data from, from soil sampling, zone, grids, whatever the case is. We have a mass amount of data now in agriculture, right? Are we using it? Are we getting value out of it? When, when we talk about what does climate do, um, we're trying to bring some, some actionable insights onto the farm. So you think about a single piece of data like uh, precipitation. Uh, you get a quarter of an inch of rain on a field. Is that valuable data? Yeah, absolutely. And think of this, the higher we go, the more value you're getting out of this. So there's, there's value there, no doubt. It's, it's good information. But what else can we do with it? We have all these data layers. So what if we say, all right, now I know we have that quarter inch of precip. What if it's on a, um, a, a clay loam soil in Minnesota? Okay, well now we know things like uh, it's water holding capacity, um, infiltration, percolation, those soil properties, and we can apply that quarter inch of rain to the soil, right? And, and we're adding more value to that information that we have. Now, if we can talk about nitrogen then, and say, hey, this is a soil that, that holds its water, does not drain quickly, and we know the temperature of that soil, can we start modeling denitrification, right? How long has that soil been saturated? What's the soil temp? That's what's gonna drive denitrification. Okay. And ultimately, can we get to a point where we're giving you enough insights for you and whoever your trusted advisor is to make recommendations about nitrogen? You'll, you'll see in our product, we aren't going to tell you, you need to put on 40 pounds. That, that's not what we're in. What we're in is saying, hey, based on the conditions that we've had and the forecasts that we have moving forward and your farming practices, this is what we're modeling out for, for a nitrogen loss scenario. Okay. Now, here is actionable 
dis information that you can make a decision off of, right? Instead of just having that gut feeling of loss, now we can quantify that. Or as you'll see today in this presentation, um, things like mineralization. Um, really saw some neat things this year. So that's what we do, we do data science, right? Provide insights into the, the field to the farm that can't be seen with the naked eye. Okay, I mean, I mean it's, it's simple. Um, we know mineralization is, exists, it, it always has, but, but how much in a given year? Well, you know, egg and whole just kind of says, oh, it depends, and that's the correct answer, it does depend. Okay, but can we farm with more information and make actionable decisions out of this? Okay, it all sounds great, right? That's, that's, that's perfect, you can sell that, right? But let's get into this a little bit more. Let's, uh, let's tell stories, that's what I like to do. All right, uh, there once was a farmer named David. Okay, there's his place right there. Uh, he's got some hogs, got some cattle, uh, corn, soybeans, wheat. Uh, there's a the hog barn right there. Um, he had uh, two daughters. His oldest daughter married incredibly well to a very, very handsome man. Uh, this, is my, this is my father-in-law right here, okay? <laughs> you laugh at the handsome part, I know, I'm tough. Uh, so uh, this, this is my father-in-law, okay? And um, you'll notice the hog barns right here. And what our practices had been for working with that management is, is using a hose drag um, scenario to get rid of the manure. So literally there would be a pump, okay, underneath this barn there's a pit, there's manure in it, and we would li literally pump that out, giant hose, and go back and forth and, and apply manure, okay? to get rid of the manure for fertility. We understand how that works. Um, the issue with that is um, for the equipment that we were using, uh, we needed to maintain a certain amount of volume going through that system and we couldn't get below 5,000 gallons to the acre of, of finishing bar manure. Some of you that will mean nothing. Some of you probably will say, whoa, 5,000 gallons, that's, that's a lot of nitrogen, that's a lot of phosphorus, and, and you're absolutely right. Um, we said, you know what, we're not getting the acres covered we can and there's an over application there in most years what are our options, okay? And it's not as simple as just turning down that rate because the machines weren't working then. So uh, ultimately, uh, David decided to go ahead and, and purchase uh, this setup right here, okay? It's a 12,000 gallon tank, um, and, and you put the manure in there, and we can apply it variable rate to whatever kind of application rates we want, okay? And so this was in 2013, okay? And we had just gotten the wheat off. This is in August and we're out there applying manure. And, and Jason, you're probably thinking, well, I really hope they're using our products. And, and Dr. Beal, you're thinking, this guy's an idiot, right? But the whole point is, is that um, this was a brand new piece of equipment and we had no idea how long it was gonna take. How many loads can we do in a day? What's travel gonna be like? We just had no idea. So my father-in-law said, you know what? You know, harvest is coming. We, we don't know what we're doing. Let's get out there and get comfortable with this machine. Okay, so that's what we did. Uh, put on about 3,500 gallons of manure. Uh, target application was about 135 pounds. According to you, you know, yeah, we're, we're following that range. Okay, felt good about that. So that was roughly August 15th of 2013. Uh, let's go to fast forward to, to June. Okay, that's 304 days away. Um, roughly, we're saying, and my point in bringing that up is, talking about when the nitrogen is applied in that field versus when uptake really, really kicks in. Um, it's about 300 days apart. And we put on 135 pounds in August. Okay, so how much is gonna be available from August to that next April, that next May, that next June? Yeah, you're shaking your head saying no. And, and you're right, because we're just saying, hey, there was rainfall events, there was leaching, there was denitrification. Are we gonna run short? Are we gonna decrease yields? And we just sit there and look at each other. And this is, this is what I stammered through when my father-in-law, who's 6'5", is looking at me and saying, how much should we put on, Rick? You teach soils. Oh, um, ultimately, this is what we said. Let's put on 40 pounds of nitrogen as urea, pre-plant, put that down. That's what we're going to do. Okay? 50 cents a pound, 20 bucks an acre, 20 bucks on 460 acres of, of manure ground. We spent $9,000 on what I can confidently say now was insurance nitrogen then. Yeah, we're covering our loss. We know we don't want to run short. This is what we'll do. Sound good, David? Sounds good. He writes the check. We, we go. We run with this thing. Okay, I, I'm not going to give you that one yet. So, um, crop was good. Had a good year. Um, you know, things were looking good. And so at the end of the season, we decided to take some stock nitrate tests. Now, um, these aren't the be-all, end-all tests of nitrogen, but it's, it's an indicator. In my opinion, you can, sorry, pick up some trends of what's going on out in the field. And so I'd ask everyone to put their cameras down when I show you this next one because 
we took samples of those fields and the lowest field was 940 parts per million and the highest was 11,000. And they, they ranged between there, yeah. Somebody just whistled, I, I know that's not, this is, I, we're looking at these and my father-in-law is looking at these and just to give you, this is the range. And he, 700 to 2,000 is optimum, 2,000 plus is excessive. My father-in-law is looking at these, we get through three and he looks up and looks at me, keeps on going and pretty soon he's not even looking, he's just scowling at me. <sighs> Okay, uh, you know, and the point of this is, this is not what you would expect. Um, I was expecting to be on the other end of the spectrum because, you know, we know that loss occurs, we know leaching, um, denitrification, uptake, all that happens, and I was not expecting to see these numbers at all, okay? Th th they were shocking to me, okay? So based on our yield response uh, and, you know, the stock nitrate test, that's, that 40 pounds was maybe a waste, okay? $9,000 that we didn't need on this operation. Okay, well, how did this happen? Okay, because we couldn't quantify leaching, denitrification, and mineralization, and this was the big one on that field. Okay, how, how do we know how much there is? Uh, we, he didn't want to run out. Uh, we need the bushels for the hogs, right? Uh, emotion, you know, we just said, well, we got to put something on, we got to do something. Okay, um, before we get to that one. So ultimately what happened here is that on a lot of these fields, um, in Minnesota, we have a, a growing season that's about a, this this long or so. Uh, but the benefit is is we have soils that have between four and six percent organic matter. We have some dynamite soils. A lot of these fields we're getting a lot of minerals, a lot of nitrogen through mineralization. Now, still we can only guess that's what happened in that year because we had these excess levels and we didn't have a shortage. But we know how nitrogen works, so it had to come from somewhere. So we're saying, hey, mineralization occurred on those fields, and we underestimated it big time. Okay. All right, so I'm talking from a farmer perspective. It's time to get back to climbing a little bit and, and show you what our tool did this past year, okay? And I kind of took two ends of the spectrum. We looked at this field in, in northern Indiana, and these guys, it was wet for them. And you can see tile lines showing up, uh, the stress plant there, whether it's a uh, lack of nitrogen from leaching or denitrification or just general stress in that plant. Um, you can see there's, <laughs> there's water issues here. And this is where we said, all right, what does the model look like, all right? We're modeling available nitrogen in that field. Let's take a look. So this comes straight from climate, a little screenshot if you want to get into some of the weather data that we provide. Okay, in northern Indiana, uh, I said from April 1st to, to August 15th, okay? How much precipitation? So a five-year average, you can see up there, compare a five-year average, about 21 inches of, of precip, what they got. This year, 34 inches in that same timeline, okay? A lot more water, no surprise there. This is pretty crazy as well. They had 16 rainfall events greater than one inch, three rainfall events greater than two inches, and three and a half inches on June 7th. So it was saturated soils staying wet, okay? And warm saturated soils staying wet. Conditions are perfect for denitrification. Leaching is gonna occur, no doubt, okay? This, these are the questions that they're asking. Will my crop run short in nitrogen? Yield loss, should I apply? How much? What, what do you do in that situation, right? Um, right now, it's a lot of it is, is what's your gut telling you? Um, what, is, what are you hearing? What are the trends? What are your neighbors doing? Um, and we feel like we can do, we can get to a better spot than that, okay? This is, this is a, these are screenshots from last year's model of, of what they put in. So in that field in Indiana, 200 bushel uh, yield goal, they put on some spring anhydrous, 170 pounds, and some uh, UAN, some 28% as well, to the tune of 182 pounds of nitrogen for a 200 bushel yield goal. You want to look at soils, I think 4% uh, organic matter, near neutral, 110 day corn, um, previous crop was soybeans, so there's nitrogen coming in there. This is what I want to get to right here. This is what the farmer sees, okay? This is our nitrogen advisor from last year. This is what it's showing. Anything that's gray is taking the weather data, weather events that we have that have happened. Anything that's colored here, um, be it red if there's a shortfall, gr green if there's a surplus, is what we're modeling out. So, you know, again, that August 15th date is when I took this screenshot. You know, there's not a whole lot to model out. We're, we're pretty confident we're not, what's going to happen those, the rest of the year out. But this is what you see. So you see that spring application, okay, um, that they put on, plus your soybean credit, plus the mineralization, massive leaching, denitrification, and ultimately we ended up modeling out a 39-pound shortfall 
Okay. At maturity, and, and you can see this 39 pound shortfall much, much earlier than August 15th. But notice this, so you apply, okay? Availability is, is gonna be subject to um, some of the microbial processes in the soil, no doubt, and so you see there's availability, and then you see a drop with saturated soils, you see some leaching, you see less mineralization, and this thing is just jagged up and down, reflecting all those different uh, rainfall events, saturated period, and then you see this, this really steep drop off, the three and a half inches of rain on, on already saturated soils, and the other part of it is, is it, you know, this is when you're gonna start seeing the rapid uptake, uh, once we hit that middle of June time period. Um, you expect to see a drop, but to see it drop like that is, is pretty scary. This is what they were faced with out there, okay? Now, being able to say which fields have shown the most loss, right? Um, how can I prioritize which fields I can work with? And then give me a, uh, let me play out some scenarios. Let, let's put in here, and you can, you can forward think here and say, all right, what if I put in, uh, you know, take a Hagee out there and put on 40 pounds? What's that gonna look like? And see how that models out. Having that ability just to quantify some of these numbers and stuff is, is a huge advantage to really where most of us are at today. All right, so back to Minnesota now. Redwood Falls, um, two hours kind of southwest uh, of here more or less. Uh, this is what it, their, their year was like. This is more or less what we face on our farm too. It's beautiful, fantastic. Three one inch rainfall events. An inch and a half was the largest single precipitation. It was beautiful. It was never too hot. It was never too cold. It was never too wet. It was never too dry. It was just ideal. Ideal for farming. But when you are working with a nitrogen model, you start saying to yourself, mm, well, great. What is this going to show me, right? This is what uh, the one in Minnesota showed. And, and what you don't see is any significant drops or anything like this. This is perfectly smooth. And, and we said, well, okay, well, we'll wait for the next year to show some loss. But this tells more of a story than we ever thought it would, okay? On this field, we put a 225 bushel yield goal. Um, anhydrous for last fall, 125 pounds then, and then some 32% uh, in spring as well, okay? So we can see that fall anhydrous, okay? Availability as the so soil warms up, that second, that spring shot of a 32%. And you just see this thing being really, really smooth. And ultimately, we end up with a 26 pound surplus. Now. This is interesting because when you do the math on this, spring, uh, fall applied uh, anhydrous plus UAN is only 161 pounds plus some soybean credit plus organic matter, and we end up with a 26 pound surplus. You talk to the average farmer and say, this is what I put on, and you're saying I have a surplus. I was getting calls, my dealers were getting calls saying, yeah, I don't know about this thing, right? I mean, I'm ready to side dress, and this thing is saying I, that, that I have a surplus right now. You know, this, this doesn't feel right. Um, my crop isn't showing a deficiency, but you know, you, you just, you know, with the way the weather's been, it's been perfect, okay? So why aren't we showing, uh, you know, that we can get to here with, with those, right? The reason that, that I found, we started pulling soil samples, right? And the soil samples didn't look too bad. All right, so what, what's going on here? So we, we get our science team together and say, hey, let, let's really look at the components of what's going on in our model and why are we getting to this surplus. And the, the general rule of thumb, and, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, is that per percent organic matter, you get about 10 pounds of nitrogen, okay? That, that's just the, the rule of thumb, mineralization, okay? Um, so microorganisms breaking down organic matter, releasing ammonium into the soil. Okay, so uh, again, uh, on a 4% or, uh, organic matter soil, you know, 40 pounds, something like that. Okay, what our model says is that this year, with this beautiful weather that we've had, it got warm, we never hit any of those extremes, microbial activity, it was rocking, okay? And instead of 10%, uh, I'm sorry, 10 pounds per percent organic matter, we were 15, 17, 20, 22 pounds per percent organic matter, mineralization rates were very, very high. And so now all of a sudden when you put 20 pounds and you have a four or five percent organic matter, you have 80 to 100 pounds of nitrogen becoming available through miner mineralization. And, and you know, th this is big. It's like, whoa, you know, we've never been able to quantify that. Because we, because we can't and we don't know where it's at, oftentimes we'll say, well, I'll give it this base credit um, because I don't know what it's gonna do. But now, again, the ability to model this out, to visualize it and see where we're at, we can take advantage of some of that, that free nitrogen, right, that Mother Nature has given us. Um, 
when we're saying, hey, all right, now if we're gonna come back in side dress, let's take that into account and, and maybe change our application if, if need be. Ultimately, I can tell you that um, in Southwest Minnesota, where guys are seeing this, I had a farmer say, I'm going out there. I got a side dress. Um, your model's interesting, but, but I, I, I can't believe it, right? Um, I, I'm, I'm used to doing this. Uh, they bought a Haggy, that was part of it. They wanted to go out there and play. Um, and so I said, all right, fine. How much are you putting on? And he said, oh, you know, probably 30, 40 pounds. Okay. I said, all right, so if climate cost three bucks an acre last year, that's a roughly six pounds of nitrogen, are you willing to put six pounds of nitrogen, uh, six pounds of confidence in us? Yeah, okay, that's what we'll do. We'll, we'll cut back six pounds. That way, hey, climate's, climate's covered, right? Um, and, and ultimately, you know, looking back at that crop, uh, it, it never did show any deficiency. And we're looking at some late season nitrate tests and some stock nitrate results from that field. But, um, you know, this was, the, this was the story that that it told us here, where we didn't have these loss events from leaching or denitrification, but it told us something else. It said, hey, we have the ability to quantify this, and, and it really is was eye-opening, right? Questions on this right now? Okay. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Uh, you don't get a 215, 20, 25 bushel crop without, um, a, I mean, without it taking up the nitrogen. Another kind of interesting story is I had a, um, a DeKalb technical agronomist say, Rick, um, everything looked good on your, your, your nitrogen model. It was going great until late season. I started to see some nitrogen deficiency symptoms that, that your model wasn't showing. All right, let's, let's go back and investigate this thing. So we started talking about it and said, all right, um, you know, wh what, what field was it? And we, we lo were looking at this and they had a 200 bushel yield goal and this year in Minnesota, a uh, 200 bushel yield goal was very, very achievable. And the field we were on was probably closer to a 230, a 240. So the moral of the story there is, yeah, there was enough nitrogen for that 200 bushel corn crop, but for a 240 to, to, you know, plus, it took more. And that's why, you know what, we need to make sure we're paying attention to this. And if the conditions are right, you know what, let's play with this model, right? Adjust it. So um, the, the summary of this, so what does a farmer, what, what does anybody take out of this? Mineralization conditions were ideal in Minnesota. Uh, again, rates of 20 pounds plus in some cases per percent organic matter is what we saw. And there was no major loss events. It was very, very smooth. How are they gonna use this? You know, there's probably little to no value in a late season side dress. If you fertilize for that, that high potential and it's there and it can be there, okay? Um, could get by without some of those side dress where you put on enough initial nitrogen plus the mineralization rates as well. And ultimately, we can quantify some of those, those, those levels that we've never been able to before. Okay, Indiana summary. Quantify that, that denitrification loss, right? The leaching loss. Prioritize which fields, because it's simple for me to go up and say, oh, well, side dress all your fields. I understand the reality is, is can I get into that field? What's the, what's the spacing like? Can I drive down those rows? But if we can say, all right, we know you're not gonna get to it all, that, that's not maybe gonna happen. Can we prioritize and say, these are the fields that have the most potential and maybe have had some stress or haven't had some stress or however you wanna come to that decision with you and your trusted advisors, fantastic. But we can start to say, this is where we're gonna spend our resources, this is where we're gonna allocate it and we can do it better and hopefully we can avoid some of the um, over application of N, which ultimately is just going through some drainage tiles and, and, and raising troubles for us. Okay. Um, so, this is what our nitrogen visor looks like this year. Okay, I'm doing okay on time here. And this is, this is in my, my home account right here. And so, right off the bat, what I did is I just said, you know what? Let's go in here and, and put the same, let's, let's just play with this model. And so, what we're doing is we're putting on our farming practices. Okay, what we're applying for nitrogen, what uh, our yield goal is, what uh, specific variety we're planting, um, are we using uh, a stabilizer, those kind of things are going into this. And I'm just letting this thing play out on 30 years of uh, historical weather data. And the same uh, hog manure on 140 pounds of nitrogen uh, being applied across these fields, which are, uh, again, on, within, you, know, you can see they're all in the same ca uh, county or, or adjacent county. And you can see there's a lot of difference there. And I will say right now, this is driven primarily by differences in organic matter and some variability in those soils. 
Okay? Uh, but this is, this is where you just at least the aha moment. We know these numbers are, are going to change the first time it rains. Um, the impact of planting data and all that is, is it's absolutely going to change. But this is the moment where a farmer can say, so my flat rate of 150, 160, 180 pounds on every field is giving me this different results. Um, can we manage this? Why is this happening? How can I prioritize? That's what we want to get to. All right, so this is going to get even a little more exciting for Jason now. So this is back to our home farm. Uh, you'll notice the program name up there, manure with some instinct. And, and I, I promise, I, we did not plan any of this. Was there nitropyrin use? Yes, there was on this. Okay, this is on our farm this year. You want some proof? Uh, this, is, this, is, this is my job to stand right here and press the button. I get the high level stuff. Um, but this, this is what we're doing on some of our fields because now we have the ability to say, hey, you know what, I, I can track some of these specific farming practices and, and I want to see what our model's saying where we apply this, where we protected some of our nitrogen, kept in that ammonium form, versus where we didn't. And, and again, so we, we didn't apply manure um, you know, in August like we did a couple of years ago, right? Where we understand how many loads we can get out a day and how long it takes. But the reality is, is we are applying it um, in October. And when we go ahead a uh, slide, yeah, sorry, back a slide. You can see that in October, again, it's been very nice. We're looking at some soil temps bumping over 6 degrees. Okay, this is at 5 o'clock in the afternoon on the Saturday afternoon. Okay, the point is there's microbial activity, right? That conversion from um, ammonium to nitrate is occurring. So we want to say, hey, you know what? Can we use a product to stabilize this? And then can we model out that effect within climate and, and get a better handle come April? You know, when it says, is, are we going to do some, some uh, top dressing or, or incorporate before planting, pre-plant, um, as we continue through that, that season, right? If we get a lot of loss events, you know what? We're expecting to treat those fields that we had with instinct differently than the fields that, that didn't get it, right? Absolutely. And we want to be able to say, well, well quantify that impact, right? It was, a, it was a warm fall. It was a warm spring. We can expect a lot of nitrification. We can expect nitrate. So then when it's wet... Okay, what kind of loss are we expecting? This, this is what's climate's putting together, ultimately. Okay? And so what, what we have here is, um, just to show you some, that's the actual visual. There's the barn. There's flags saying, hey, there was uh, the nitropyrin use. Uh, there was, there was with where we didn't have it. And we're able to go within climate and, and put down, take a photo and say, drop a pin at this location. This is what my practices were. I took a picture of it. And this will transfer all the way over into your field view account. And that farmer has a, has a yield sense monitor or whatever he's using. He can see those pins. And when he's going up and down that field, it's instant information back to him, be able to visualize that. One other thing that uh, within climate, what you're going to get is in-season uh, imagery. Okay? Now, this, this was from this field. This was obviously this past year. Uh, you can see where some soybean plots are. But again, the, the, the whole goal of this, some of this imagery is when I go to this field, can I identify the areas of the field that, that need scouting, right? That's one of the biggest struggles, we'll say, in the farming is, is what kind of scouting do you do? Is it 20 miles per hour or 50 miles per hour past the pickup, right? Can we do a better job and say, all right, here's my field. Where can I go in it, right? And so if I can see this, this red area right here, it's probably just a soil type, not a big problem. But if all of a sudden we start seeing some, some trends here, and maybe you could even say, in this case, this is a hybrid difference, but maybe here's where that NSERV, I'm sorry, instinct application was, and saying, hey, we had, a, we had a wet year, and now all of a sudden we can visualize some of this stuff, and we can set some of our expectations of, of how this product is performing, right? And uh, when you get Purchase Climate Pro, again, the nitrogen model plus some of this, uh, this in-season imagery comes with it, and then historical imagery as well. Okay. So ultimately, the, the take-home, the sales pitch, if you will, is uh, for about the, the cost of three pounds of nitrogen. Okay. We can give you insights into what's happening in that field. And, and this is where you need to ask any farmer and say, hey, how confident are you in your nitrogen program to the tune of, Five pounds, they'll laugh. They'll say, hey, if I'm within 25 to 45 pounds, I think it'd be a success story. Can we do better than that? Yeah, I think we can, absolutely. We can do that by quantifying gains from mineralization, losses from leaching denitrification, and make some of those application decisions based on data, science-backed insights, as opposed to this is what I've always done. 
this is what my neighbor's doing, or just feeling like, oh, I have to do something, which, which a lot of us in agriculture face today. Okay. Um, John Jansen said, hey, you got to throw this up here. They got to know, because the pricing is important for us. Uh, we look at the ability to put this on an entire farm. Okay. Um, ultimately, it, it never runs more than about a buck an acre okay, on, a, on a whole farm offer. So again, the ability to say, hey, you can have these kind of insights. Um, this is our value proposition is, hey, will you, will you give us a couple pounds of nitrogen? And we think we can help you manage that to a much, much higher level. All right, just to end this up, uh, people always ask, well, where is this at? Maybe you haven't heard of it because you're in a different part of the country. So uh, the blue area is where Pro was last year. This, last year was our launch year. And uh, we had about, it was about 70, 78 million acres it covered. Um, this year, we're expanding our footprint now, of course, into the Dakotas, move north into Minnesota, um, Kansas, Nebraska. They're all getting some coverage there. Um, in terms of what kind of um, usage we're having, uh, 75 million acres are mapped in climate basic right now. Basic would be our, our free offering that's going to show, hey, what are, what's field level weather conditions at? How much should it rain in that field? Um, can I plan my operations out to say, hey, maybe we won't do any tillage over there, but over there um, they didn't receive the precip. Okay. Climate Pro then, last year uh, we, our goal was 3.5 million acres and we went over 5 million acres in our, in our limited launch area. Um, and, and again, I show you cases of that nitrogen advisor um, where we shine, okay? And, and it went well, and we're looking at continuing, making improvements, making this thing easier to um, data entry, have data flow automatically from the cab, okay? Uh, we have a device right now that'll plug into the diagnostic port of any John Deere, newer style, newer model John Deere combine or planter, and it'll automatically feed planting date, hybrid, and that stuff into our model. That's one of the biggest struggles we have is, does a farmer want to sit down and enter data? Does a retailer want to sit down with this, this farmer and help enter data? We're making that simpler, okay? All right, I'm not gonna get into Field Health Advisor. If anyone has interest in that, you know what, let's talk, but um, I have the gift of gab and I could go on for about another 45 minutes, so I won't do that. But again, I appreciate it, and if you have some additional questions, please, uh, please reach out to me. Yes, sir. Yeah, so the answer to that is, is no. H how do we figure out weather? I'll just cover that real quick. So when it rains, okay, what we're looking at is, is to, to quantify that, uh, look at how many drops are, are falling and what's the size of that. And we're using the radar feed, the National Weather Service. Okay? Um, the, the information itself is proprietary, but our ability to quantify that and convert that into rain, into precipitation, that is. So we're, that's our initial feed. So when you look at your phone and say, hey, Precip, it's based on that radar feed. What we do then is we have a network of probably about 30,000 weather stations, publicly owned, privately owned, airports, whatever the case is, and they'll report into us. And that's how we help calibrate uh, and refine some of those numbers. So you'll see within 72 hours, sometimes your precip number might, might change a little bit. As we're getting these weather stations report in, okay, we, can, we can really hone in. And it's that calibrated number that feeds into these models. Uh, some of our competitors are using weather stations. Um, private weather stations, but uh, I think scalability becomes a concern then. Any other questions? Yes, Steve. Do you look at the future yeah, yep. Um, so, uh, acre penetration, we, we, we set some pretty aggressive goals. Um, um, you know, in, uh, by 2020, if we can get around 100 million acres, that, that's, that's where we think this thing is going. Um, you know what, what's, what's going to come next, um, and I'm sure John is a little nervous about me talking about what's next, but um, it'll be additional crops, right? Uh, so wheat is going to be great. Uh, bringing on other nit nit nitrogen stabilizers. Right now we have nitropyrin. I'm sure you'd be okay if we left it at that, but um, the reason why we're able to add that one right away is because there's so much data out there. 40 years of product beats 40 years of data, so it, it's, it's pretty simple. But adding more stabilizers, more crops, and continuing to expand out the geography. Um, and then eventually, you know what, once we feel comfortable and we have nitrogen, we're in a good spot there, maybe some variable rate, zonal stuff, then let's uh, start moving on to uh, modeling out phosphorus and, and other nutrients. All right, any other questions? Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you.